All right, our next speaker is Roy Spencer. He's a principal research scientist at the University of Alabama, Huntsville, where he directs a variety of climate research projects. Mike, do you want to cover questions? Oh, we're going to cover questions at the end. Okay. So, so everybody that has questions, we're going to give everybody's presentation and cover questions at the end. So, um, Roy received his PhD in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin in 1981 and was formerly a senior scientist for climate studies at NASA. And I actually got to see Roy a couple weeks ago up in Minneapolis as he captivated some college kids, which, as many of you know, to captivate college kids is a, an amazing thing. So, so Roy? Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm going to switch presentations here. Now, what George just talked about is sort of the empirical evidence of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation um, affecting climate in North America, um, in the United States, you know, that looks like there really is some sort of connection. I'm going to put some numbers to that uh, based on new satellite observations of what happens when the PDO goes through its changes, okay? Um, I'm going to skip ahead and start with this, this cartoon right here. Let's look at the big picture. I'm going to be talking about how the PDO might be changing the whole planetary energy balance and possibly explain global warming just based on this internal mode of climate variability. But anyway, let's, let's start with the big picture. There's two ways to cause global warming on the Earth. Uh, we're we're at, a, at an average temperature. The Earth has an average temperature, the climate system does, that represents a balance between the amount of sunlight being absorbed and the amount of infrared radiation being lost to space, okay? Now, of course, the IPCC is concerned about this. You add more greenhouse gases, it reduces the rate of cooling, and then the Earth heats up until you once again regain energy balance between the absorbed sunlight and the emitted infrared. So that's the IPCC, you know, it's working over in this realm, all right? Uh, Willie Soon, who you heard speak uh, this morning after breakfast, He's saying, hey, what about the sun? You know, the source of energy, that could change, and that could be causing global warming. True. Now, what I'm going to talk about is, see all these white things? Clouds? They really affect both how much sunlight is allowed into the system and how much infrared radiation is allowed out of the system. The IPCC assumes that cloud cover on the Earth always and forever magically stays the same. Okay? <laughs> That's what they assume. You won't, if you read the documents, they won't say that. But it's, you know, the, some of the climate is, a, is, is, climate and weather is complicated, right, Bill? Yes, and it takes a lot of years before you finally put two and two together and realize, oh, I understand how it works now. Some of this stuff is going to sound like it should have been intuitively obvious to people. But, you know, this is a comp sometimes we lose the forest for the trees, okay? Now. Uh, I'm going to be showing you data from one of NASA's satellites. Uh, these are the satellites we were trying to get Congress to fund back when John Sununu was, uh, was, was helping out in the White House. Um, and I'm thankful we got them up there. This is, uh, this is NASA's Aqua spacecraft. All instruments on it are still working well. This is the one that I'm the lead scientist on right here. It's an instrument that's built by Japan, monitors Arctic sea ice. You've heard about the Arctic sea ice. Uh, depleting and all of that, and it measures all kinds of other things, see surface temperatures. Let's get back to this idea of what causes global warming. This is something new today. I'm going to try this analogy. I'm going to show you, I'm going to be showing results based on a really simple climate model. I went back to the beginning and said, what is the very simplest model you can have of global temperature change? And in fact, I got some help from the IPCC scientists on that. They suggested Here's the best one to use. It's what I'm going to use. It's not my invention. But basically, a temperature change is related to energy imbalance, okay? And I'm going to use the example of a pot of water on the stove. You put a pot of water on the stove, you turn the heat on. Heat starts pumping into it at a certain rate, and the thing starts warming up, right? Let's say the, the, the stove is on low. Okay, so you get the water warming up, warming up. Well, eventually, it stops warming. It reaches a constant warm temperature and stays there even though you've got the stove on low and it's still pumping heat into it. How can that be? It's because temperature change isn't related to how much heat you're pumping into something. It's related to a balance between the heat going in and the heat being lost. 
So in the case of a pot of water on the stove, okay, it's going to warm up to a certain temperature until the energy lost by the pot to its surroundings equals the rate of energy gained from the stove. Uh, and when we talk about global warming, it's kind of like putting a thin lid on the pot. You're reducing the Earth's ability to lose energy, which is what happens when you put you know, a lid on a pot of water, right? The water's going to get a little hotter before it ends up reaching a new state of energy balance and a new constant temperature. And an important part of all this is feedback. Now, I know that this is difficult to understand, but it really is key to the whole global warming issue. Feedback in the climate system will determine whether global warming, man-made global warming, is just a blip on climate variability, natural climate variability, or whether it's going to destroy us all. It's all about feedback, okay? That's where all of the uncertainty is. So the first thing I have to do is demonstrate to you that the satellite data shows negative feedback, which is what John Sununu was referring to this morning, and actually why so many people have been fooled into thinking that they see positive feedback, okay? But feedback, in the case of this pot on the stove, would be like a valve in the cover, okay? That as the, as the uh, pot warms up, if the valve opens and lets more heat out, that would be negative feedback. But as the pot warms up, if the valve kept closing as it got hotter and hotter, that'd be positive feedback, amplifying the warming. Feedbacks are key. Okay, now let's switch to the left here. Simple model of the climate system. And th this is just the simplest way that you can describe temperature variability of the climate system. You have a forcing, which is analogous to the stove. Now that can be a change in clouds, it can be adding CO2, whatever you want. I just, you know, put a cartoon of a cloud here. But also, there's this feedback that when the temperature of the system changes, how does that then change the cloudiness, which affects how much sunlight is reflected back to space, which then changes the system. That's where all of the uncertainty is, and that's where I spend all of my time and research, okay? This is a very simple equation. If you don't like equations, then just ignore it. But all it is is a mathematical expression of what's going on with a temperature change. A change in the temperature with time, this is actually a change in the temperature away from equilibrium, uh, is due to some sort of energy imbalance. This forcing is just an energy imbalance imposed on the system, like turning up the heat on the stove. And then the feedback that either acts to amplify the temperature change or reduce it. And then you have to deal with the heat capacity of the system. For instance, if you've only got two inches of water, you're heating up, this is a really tiny number, and you get huge temperature changes. If you're heating up 100 meters of ocean, then the change in temperature is, is pretty small. Um, these are things that I just already mentioned. I'm not going to talk about the details. Okay, this is something that we published in November. And uh, this brings up why um, I got into this business in the first place. I used to ask people, how do the modelers know that there's positive feedback in the climate system? And they would give me the example, well, we've noticed that in year-to-year -year natural climate variability, when the Earth is unusually warm, there's fewer low clouds. That lets more sunlight in, which enhances the warming. And I always wondered, how do they know that the warming caused fewer low clouds, and it wasn't the fewer low clouds that caused the warming? Turns out they didn't know. Computational physicist that works with me, PhD level, said, oh, they couldn't be that dumb. Well, guess what? <laughs> we, we made up this simple model, and we tested it and uh, wrote a paper, and two IPCC scientists uh, reviewed it and said, yeah, this is a valid issue, and it's published, and of course, since then, everyone has ignored it. Uh, but this is one of the outcomes of the paper, is if you take that simple model, and here's one of uh, George's time series, uh, force the model with just random daily cloud variations. The, uh, the red is the radiative forcing, the changes in the input of, the, of, the, of heat into the ocean, uh, here's that blue is the resulting temperature change. And then here's how we estimate feedbacks, is we plot how much energy is lost to space versus the temperature. This is, this is a feedback uh, thing. This is, this is how everybody estimates feedback, feedbacks, is when the system warms up, how much extra energy is being lost to space. If it's a whole bunch of extra energy, then that's negative feedback. If you only lose a little bit of extra energy, then that could be positive feedback. The point is, is the slope of the line fit to the data is what determines feedback. It's the slope of that line. Well, in the case of radiative forcing, 
there is uh, no slope to the line, okay? And in fact, we discovered, which should have been obvious to IPCC people 20 years ago, that you cannot measure feedback in the presence of radiative forcing. It's not possible. Leads to 100% error in diagnosed feedback. Okay, this is for radiative forcing. And I've had a couple scientists say, oh, but how do we know whether clouds cause temperature changes? Well, guess what? We've looked at all of the IPCC models and they all show evidence of radiative forcing. It turns out that radiative forcing of temperature changes always produces a spiral pattern. And it shows up in all of the models. These are, uh, each dot is a yearly average and they're plotted every month. So it's like, you know, a year's worth of model evolution is through here and then through here. And, and what these are are variations in the energy imbalance of the system. Energy balance occurs right at the origin. Anytime you're away from the origin, you've got energy imbalance. For instance, over in this quadrant, you've got energy accumulating. The temperature is below normal, which means it's going to go this way. And what you get is this spiraling behavior, which is due to the radiative forcing. Okay? Now, here's the other kind of, of forcing you can get, non-radiative. This would be uh, changes in evaporation and precipitation. The reason why this comes up, uh, which is going to go along with what Bill Gray is going to talk about, is in the climate system, there's two ways to cause a temperature change. One is radiatively, which is what the IPCC talks about. The other way is non-radiatively, which is related to the fact that temperature in the climate system isn't always meaning heat content because you've got the atmosphere, which only has a heat content of two meters of water, and then you've got the ocean, which can hold a whole lot more heat. So temperature is, an is not an indication of heat content. The point is, is that there's a, another kind of forcing, which is non-radiative forcing, and that perfect, you can perfectly get the feedback. I'm going to have to skip along here because it's hard to fit into 20 minutes, but basically non-radiative forcing, you cannot measure feedbacks from, uh, I'm sorry, radiative forcing, you cannot measure feedbacks from. Non-radiative forcing, you can perfectly, in the context of this simple model. In the real world, both things happen. This is, again, output from the simple model. And now we start getting data that looks like satellite data. In fact, I didn't show that to begin with because I didn't want to overwhelm you too much early on, <laughs> which is right here. This is what satellite data looks like. And these are global averages, okay? Global average. We're talking about the big picture, global warming. Here's change in temperature. Here's the change in how much radiant energy is lost to space. And they've thought that the slope of that line is due to feedback. Well, part of it is feedback. And when, but the trouble is, is it's being obscured by those radiative forcing things that are going on. So here's the simple model driven by both radiative and non-radiative forcing. Here's a true feedback. The slope of that line is what we specified in the model. What you diagnose is less. And if it goes horizontal, that is a borderline unstable climate system. This is key. The more closer you get to horizontal with that line, the closer you are to an unstable climate system. So automatically what we're seeing here is that the existence of radiative forcing in the system, which is caused by natural cloud variations, uh, will obscure any evidence of negative feedback. So it turns out that the spirals that you see in model output, aren't, you can't get feedback from, but if there's any stripes in the data, remember those lines? Then that is an indication of the feedback, and I even find it in the climate models that the meandering behavior of one of these climate models, here's a GFDL climate model, if you fit a line to it, it looks like you've got positive feedback, but when, in fact, these striations indicate the real feedback. Okay, let's go to the real climate system. This is what I'm interested in, is analyzing satellite data to figure out how their real climate system works, okay? Well, here we see some evidence of this meandering behavior. This is uh, seven and a half years from the Terra satellite, which is one of NASA's main satellites change in the radiative balance of the Earth, change in the average temperature of the Earth, some meandering kind of behavior, but then there's these linear striations. The slope of those linear striations is much steeper than what's in the climate models. That feedback parameter, that slope, corresponds to a global warming of about half a degree C by the end of the century. 
very strong negative feedback. And this is what we see in the satellite data is evidence of really strong negative feedback. If you're careful about how you interpret the data, you have to be careful about how you interpret the data. This is the, here's this from data from a satellite that I work with, Aqua. It's been going for five years. Uh, even a line fitted to the data, even though it's contaminated by some radiative forcing spiraling from due to cloud variations, I still get a, uh, a negative feedback parameter that is so strong it would make man-made global warming sort of a non-issue, okay? So, strongly negative feedback means radiative forcing from extra CO2 is too weak to cause global warming. This is why I'm talking about feedback before I'm talking about the PDO. It takes more than just a forcing to cause a temperature change. You gotta know what the feedbacks are to know how big the temperature change is gonna be. So before I went to the PDO, I wanted to establish that there is a uh, negative feedback in the system because I'm now gonna use that simple model to explain temperature variations over the last 100 years based on the PDO alone. So George and other people before me, especially George, last talk, talked about, hey, Notice the PDO is in its positive phase during this period of warming, negative phase during this slight cooling, and now we're global temperatures. This isn't just the US, this is global. Uh, positive phase again during this period of warming. All I did was ask the question, hey, maybe the PDO is an index of cloud cover of the Earth. Maybe when the PDO changes phase, it changes cloudiness slightly. You can explain all of global climate change we've seen in the last 2,000 years based on just 1% changes in cloud cover, okay? It doesn't take much. So I ran this very simple model. I ran all different combinations of ocean depth and feedbacks and foreseen from the PDO causing cloud changes and I asked the computer, give me back all the simulations that look like the observed temperature trend. So here now we're talking about the 20th century, gray line is the observed temperature trend, PDO only, that dashed curve, is when I force the model with cloud changes assumed to be associated with the PDO. And you can see it captures this weird behavior, which is what George was talking about. But now I'm putting numbers to it. I'm using a simple climate model to show that if the PDO changes clouds, it can cause what we've seen in the last 100 years. Now, I also added in here Jim Hansen's forcings, which is increasing CO2 and other stuff, but the PDO only explains 75% of the global warming trend. But what have I assumed that's so important? I've assumed that the clouds have changed by a certain amount with the PDO. How do we know that? Well, it turns out that the history of the PDO index during the period of time the satellites were up there looks like the energy imbalance of the Earth. And if we go to all seven and a half years, this is the bottom line here, all seven and a half years of Terra satellite data, here's Chain, here's radiative forcing due to the PDO. Here's the PDO index. There is a relationship between them, fairly highly correlated. I forget what it is, but it's like 70% explained variance or something like that. It's, these are global, yearly global averages. Each one of those dots represents millions of observations from the satellites, okay? But the point is, is look, the data does align along, that, that solid line is fit to the data, and see that dashed line? That's what the model said would be the ideal relationship between the PDO and clouds to best explain temperature variation during the 20th century. I mean, here we've gone from hypothesis to a simple theoretical experiment to data validation, you know, data from the satellites that actually show what the model predicted. And then, uh, of course, it's been mentioned that we might be in a new negative uh, phase of the PDO. For 2008, we don't have the data yet but um, it's gonna be in here somewhere. It'll be interesting, well, I know the PDO average is here. The question is what will the satellite show? So I'm anxious to see when we get more satellite data whether indeed it shows that the Earth is in this cooling phase uh, due to the PDO. But basically, that's it. Uh, I wanted to just show that indeed with some simple climate modeling, you can show that the PDO causes most of what we've seen in terms of global warming. In order to do so, you need really strongly negative feedback, which is what we see, this, that's what's assumed in this, is the negative feedback I've observed uh, from the data.